Hello. Uh, nice to meet you guys. Uh, I hope you're doing well. Uh, my name is Derek Cowell, and um, this uh, online class uh, will, will um, I think, become rather predictable. Okay, so it's, it's nothing that uh, you'll find uh, difficult to um, adjust to because it'll become rather predictable. Okay, um, a couple things about myself. Um, I uh, went to a small Catholic school in which we sat in circle, uh, circular tables, and we would discuss the Greco-Roman classics and, and other works. And they would, they would almost do the, um, the, uh, the Socratic dialogue uh, method, whereby they would ask us questions, uh, which would lead us to uh, a, a solution or an answer to which we felt fairly confident until they threw a monkey wrench into the equation and began to um, ask us something that completely challenged uh, our assumption and our conclusion that we had just uh, come up with. So I thought about that and I thought about how useful I think that is as far as um, becoming a better rational being as a human being uh, living in this republic. Um, and also not to mention uh, just becoming more useful to your life, no matter what you do for a living, no matter what your major is and your career uh, uh, chooses to be. And, um, and it makes history a little less boring for those of you who have to take history uh, as a requirement, okay? So what I'm going to do is uh, in this class, uh, should you stay in it, we are going to do, uh, the, this is the contemporary one. Uh, I go back and forth as to which one's my favorite, uh, to be honest, but I mean, you can't lose with the contemporary one. We get into some good stuff, especially by the end of the semester. Um, but at any rate, um, we we agreed upon uh, certain uh, topics, right? Certain themes in American history. Uh, we as the uh, college instructors uh, to create somewhat of a a broad um, kind of um, just outward foundation for a curriculum, but we still get to choose our own curriculum, which I love. All right, and so I like to think that you know if you were to take your your 101 class or someone else, that this class here will still somehow uh, dovetail with what you're taking and what you're going to take uh, in 101, regardless of our unique subjective uh, styles that we as instructors uh, bring to the table, okay? And so um, with me, I, I want you to become familiar uh, with the basics of latter half of US history. Uh, not only do I, but like I said, we've kind of, uh, considered that a, um, we call them slows, uh, student learning outcomes, etc. Uh, so you have, we're going to look at the um, the integration or the attempt thereof of African Americans at the end of the Civil War, the so-called um, reintegration of the South into the Union at the end of the Civil War. And we'll get into um, the burgeoning second industrial revolution, which is the more uh, salient, the one that stands out the most, um, industrial revolution of the two. Uh, and we'll get into uh, issues of equity, fairness, uh, class conflict, uh, mobility, um, uh, power, etc. And I think I'm, I'm hoping you'll find some of that interesting. And then also we will deal with immigration at this same period at the end of the 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s. And we'll, uh, we'll have an assignment just on that and all the themes that, that you probably have become already familiar with, we'll try to address in that assignment. And then of course we get into um, idealism uh, when it comes to the progressive movement, uh, supposedly trying to improve not only society, not only America, uh, not only uh, certain classes within the United States, but individuals, right? It was contended to be a very idealistic, very um, very humanitarian and altruistic movement, okay? Uh, but then, of course, others contend no way, okay? And they, uh, they have their own more cynical views. And so then we will also cover um, the overseas imperialism, uh, us becoming an overseas imperialist colonizer. So we grab 
for a couple years. Uh, we grabbed um, uh, Cuba. Uh, we took Puerto Rico. We took the Philippines for quite some time. Uh, anyway, we'll, we'll look at all that stuff and different interpretations as to how to describe our entrance into that um, type of um, fraternity, if you will, of colonizing forces, uh, context of that day, what was going on percolating and ideas, economics, et cetera. Then um, in, no matter what teacher you have, uh, you should uh, go into uh, Woodrow Wilson in World War I. I choose to uh, address it around the theme of Woodrow Wilson's gap between what he practiced and what he preached. And we'll get more into that later. And then the Roaring Twenties, uh, I didn't uh, stretch it too far, my imagination. I just went off of the most prevalent uh, theme that I've come across reading books on that topic. And that is uh, the culture war between those who were embracing the changes of the 1920s, calling themselves moderns, and those who were um, fighting against them as, quote, traditionalists, okay? So then you have the uh, Great Depression and the New Deal and our uh, desire to get out of that, uh, how the, a myriad of different interpretations to Franklin Roosevelt and his New Deal. Uh, we'll look at some of them. And then World War II, we're going to apply it to the Catholic Church's notion of just war doctrine. Was it a, quote, just war, a, quote, righteous war against the fascist countries of World War II? And then that transitions into the Cold War. And you play the blame game, okay? Probably not the most intellectually deep type of um, dialogue I, I chose on that one. But it's still, I, I find it interesting uh, playing the blame game there. And then, of course, you have the transition into the civil rights movement. And then after the civil rights movement, we will do the Cold War Part II uh, with Vietnam and other uh, components to the, the latter part of the 1970s, et cetera. Uh, our fight or competition against um, global, the global dissemination of communism. All right. And so um, after we do about four topics, then we do a, um, a test, then four more, then we do a test and so forth. Okay. So let's see here. Sorry. All right. So I will look at that later. Um, Sharing the screen, let's take a look. So notice the important days here, okay? You have um, the 22nd is the last chance to get a refund. Uh, the 23rd is the census date, whereby I have to drop no-shows. So make sure that if, if you desire to continue in this class, that you have had, you will have had submitted at least one assignment. By January 23rd. All right. Uh, drop with no W, the 22nd. Uh, pass no pass, the 7th of February. A drop with a W, but instead of an F, uh, April 3rd. Okay. So then going down here. So I promise to provide instruction uh, through a combination of the material that is put into these argumentative assignments, okay, and to my uh, lecture of such. I promise to encourage free critical thinking, okay? I also promise to do my best to make it clear what I'm expecting of you. Uh, especially pertaining to these 13 in a 16-week semester, uh, virtually 13 um, argumentative uh, write-up submissions that I ask of you. And what I also, as far as being available and helpful, uh, note that you feel free to Canvas message me, okay? If that's not working, all right, which it should, because uh, I, I have a slower semester this time. I'm still at a second school with other classes, but it's relatively slower uh, from last semester. But if, um, you know, you Canvas messaged me two, three times, I still haven't responded. By all means, message me and ask me 
um, for a little extra help. And at that point, I don't think it'll get to that. Usually it doesn't. I'm not that remiss in checking my uh, Canvas messages. But if I need to, as I did last semester, I will just give you a phone number uh, if need be uh, to send uh, feedback back and forth as far as what is entailed with the assignments and what I expect. All right. Um, so we're going to get into that soon. The assignments themselves. All right. So argumentative assignments and tests. So you see, this is my other one. This is my in-class one. So yours is going to be a little different here at the bottom. All right. As a matter of fact, this has the wrong topics. The topics that you have on Canvas are the right ones. And I'll have it like this with the right topics undergirding or in the same row as the dates. And with your dates and so forth, um, I'm going to, uh, I, I like to give you guys the maximum amount of time. And so I usually give you until Sunday evening. So I, I you know, I assign that, that given week's argumentative assignment on a Monday. And you have until that, that following Sunday night at midnight uh, to turn it in. Okay, so please don't wait too long in doing that. But let's see here. That's not what I'm looking for. Okay, so here's a, a case in point. What I would have asked you to do had we been in class, right? I would have spread this, by the way, into two days as they often are on the um, the uh, in-class schedule, an hour and a half, twice a week, right? I would have asked you to go through uh, sections one and two regarding the Civil War um, as a group more often than not, uh, if the maturity levels can handle it, and if not, uh, individually, quietly in class. And so then what, right? And then you come to the conclusion, okay, now I want you to analyze and evaluate um, what you've read. Because remember, okay, everything that I put down is a popular or thought-provoking thesis that I have read in an opinionated book that I have sat under and listened to by an opinionated professor, et cetera, okay? So some of these argumentative pieces that I put together, I literally did them with tongue in cheek, right? Not even myself, not fully, not fully accepting them uh, for, for, for full truth, okay? So I do that because, like I said, I want you guys to work on your critical thinking skills. And for those of you who, uh, even if just one or two of you, uh, become history uh, majors, this is what they have you do in grad school, is read two, three very divergent uh, theories, interpretations on the same topic, and weigh each of them as, as to credibility in your estimation. And most important, most importantly, why? You have to prove why one of those three books was the most credible of the three. All right? It's argument. It's thesis. So that's what I'm asking you to do here. And then this one also, by asking you to simply read one and two, I'm more, I'm more inclined or just as inclined to just give you the context. Maybe some of you, it's been a while since you've done U.S. history, since you've covered the Civil War uh, and, and read the, the standard narrative of it. And so I'm, I'm uh, refreshing your memory, so to speak, all right, with numbers one and two to show you a couple different ways by which um, it supposedly went down. So for instance, Paul Johnson's book, okay, History of the American People. This guy right away asks rhetorically, remember you have a rhetorical question, you're implying that the answer is obvious. You already know the answer while asking the question. He 
see here, sorry. Very first page of this book. Firstly, can a nation rise above the injustices of its origins and by its moral purpose and performance atone for them? And then it goes on to say all nations are born in war, conquest, crime, right? Covetousness. And leave stains on the historical record. And the U.S. is no different, he said. They have the stains of a dispossessed indigenous people who had their land taken from them, the Native Americans, and an enslaved race, the African Americans. Okay. However, grieving such wrongs must be balanced by the erection of a society dedicated to justice and fairness. During the process of nation building, idealism, altruism, were mixed successfully with acquisitiveness and ambition. Did we get the mixture right? So this guy takes it easy on the U.S. He's almost blasé with sin, national sins like slavery and genocide of Native Americans, right? But says, but Americans were very idealistic people. They wanted to improve the world and change the world for the better. So did they make up for those sins? And of course, like I said, that's meant to be a rhetorical question. He thinks they did. Okay. So that's one way. That's one type of a history book that you may have come up with, especially when you were children, when I was a child. Okay. And then you have Howard Zinn. Now, this is his 20th century history. I currently am trying to find my uh, people's history. I'm terrible. I had to, and I may have lent them both out to students. But he has the same preface, so I could still use this for the preface. So Roman numerals 8 and 9 of his preface. He says, history is merely the memory of states. Right? So basically, history is written by the winners, okay? My viewpoint in telling my history of the United States shall be different, that we must not accept memory of states as our own memory. Nations are not cohesive communities, and they never have been. The history of any country presented as the history of a family conceals fierce conflicts of interest, sometimes exploding, most often repressed, between conquerors and conquered, between masters and slaves, between capitalists and their workers, between the dominators and the dominated in race and sex. And in such a world of conflict, a world of victims and of executioners, it is the job of thinking people as Albert Camus suggested, not to be on the side of the executioners. So Howard Zinn, before long, he admits that he's a, he's Marxist in his view. He believes that American society, particularly after independence, when we developed a Darwinian capitalistic economy, that it's it, it's in a way that there's there's absolutely no equity. There's, there's no um, economic balance or fairness, right? That the rich just get richer, the poor get poorer. Uh, for someone to succeed, someone else has to lose, right? And as he says there, he wants you to empathize with those who lost. So the demographics of the civil rights movement, uh, Native Americans, African Americans, women, Asian Americans, they are um, seen as um, oppressed groups, right, by Howard Zinn. And then also just generally the working class, okay, with no hope of advancement. So at any rate, think about that, okay, uh, for the whole semester, not just for this assignment. So in this one with number one, 
if you've had time to look at it so far, is look for this being an interpretation that we might receive as children in elementary school. All right. This out of the ordinary, this anomalous generation of the 1830s through 50s arises and says, you know what, guys? We're no longer okay with the status quo. We're no longer, you know, uh, placing appeasement and, and um, avoidance of conflict above our principles. Some things in our principles are so strongly violated in the, in the United States that it's worth picking a fight for them, over them. So they were called, right, these uh, abolitionists, they were called agitators. And quite a few of the abolitionists were very proud of that moniker. Because to them, right, absolutely we're troublemakers. We're stirring trouble over a righteous cause. So look for evidence of this unusual generation that begins to make a lot of noise disproportionate to its small numbers, uh, begins to use heavy armed political tactics in Congress, all right? Begins to flood the South with anti-slavery literature and the South was furious over it, uh, endorses uh, breaking of the law, right? whether it be the Underground Railroad or whether it be their liberty laws, whereby they refuse to turn back fugitive slaves to the South. All right. And then you have, and like I said, some of you may remember this from, from childhood renditions of the Civil War. And then you have the timely evolution of Abraham Lincoln, right? And by the way, these agitators are going to have a growing space, a growing platform from which to make a lot of noise disproportionate to their small numbers, such as the Lyceums or intellectual fairs and the cylindrical rotary press uh, with having their, their, um, their speeches and pamphlets uh, printed and spread throughout the country. All right. Some even, Sam and Chase, James Ashley, some of them even went on a campaign telling the white, poor white folk of the South that the rich, slave-owning white men in the South did not think of them as allies, but they were using them, and that they should be as angry with the, the wealthy slave owners as the African Americans were. So to the Southerners, right, that's stirring up uh, insurrection. Then Abraham Lincoln comes in. And I like that quote right there. Abraham Lincoln says, if A can enslave B, why can't B enslave A? Oh, because B is black. And white is color, and, and A is, is white. So it's color then that is the demarcating arbiter, decider. But take care, he said, you're going to become a slave to the next man you meet with skin fairer than your own. Oh, you don't mean color. You mean that the whites are intellectually superior to the blacks and therefore have the right to enslave them. Take care again. By this rule, you might become the slave of the next man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. He had a way of, of ruffling feathers, Mr. Lincoln. All right. And so then you had these, um, these polarizing events in the 1850s that almost made Americans choose a side. So when they were trying to decide on slavery in Kansas and they had a referendum, a general election, both sides claimed that they won, and it resorted in a civil war in Kansas. 
that oftentimes, you know, provoked Americans to pick a side. The Dred Scott case was severe and keeping African Americans from being able to sue in court and had gone a step backward and then reaching free soil and thereby becoming free. Right? John Brown, a white abolitionist, uh, tried to spread out arms to spread a slave rebellion in Virginia and was captured and executed instead. So a lot of drama. So all this started, according to this narrative, right? Because of the courage, the idealism. When I say idealism, I just think of you don't see the world as it is, but as it ought to be in a better way of this special generation of people. Then number two, I take a 180. This is more of a Howard Zen take. Contending, right? That there was as much racism in the northern states as there as there was existed in the southern states. That the federal government dragged its feet on one revolutionary policy after another, declaring slaves free, granting them land for unrequited labor. Using them as soldiers, etc. And then you get these suggestions that it was only when the North became desperate enough that it needed to do something else to give itself an edge over the South, to give purpose to all the suffering that it had endured. That it finally, hesitantly, embraced something that might be considered tantamount to A pseudo, a so-called crusade. But only when it became convenient. If they could free them and use them as soldiers, their numbers would help in battle. And psychologically, it might break the will of the South, seeing black soldiers fight against them. And it might create a divide and conquer atmosphere in which where the Union armies came near, slaves would, one plantation after another, rise and rebel against their masters. So hence, when the war ends and the Union prevails and forces the 11 southern states to come back into the union and to sign the 13th amendment which abolished slavery that maybe this wasn't maybe this was a lot messier than a crusade So keep that in mind as you read number three. And I feel like my title says it all. The federal government's zeal, right, to change the South waned when the going got tough. And then look at the last one. Reconstruction failed because it didn't squash racism at its source. So notice, in cases like this, I give away what my intended thesis is just from my 
my my uh my title alone. So can I get a little bit of confirmation? How are you guys doing? Any questions, especially on the first day? No, so I take no as you guys are okay, that you guys got this. Can I get a thumbs up at least from anybody? You guys there can hear me? You're kind of capturing the gist. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. All right. So with the first one here to choose from between three and four, the argument is, is kind of like the, um, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. At the end of the civil war, when Lincoln was killed and his racist Southern vice president, right? To so-called balance the ticket. Uh, became president and he pardoned the white Confederate leaders, gave them their lands back and pushed the ex-slaves or freedmen off their lands, chose handpicked racist white governors for each of the Southern states to have and allowed them to institute by their state legislators uh, black codes that were highly discriminatory toward African Americans that supposedly all Republicans had to do who had fought that war, according to the Times, was raise the bloody shirt or wave the bloody shirt. You probably know what that means. And saying, guys, we had over 300,000 Yankee boys die in this war over the stubbornness of the South. Did they die for nothing? And that's where you get the equal and opposite reaction. You had the 1866 congressional elections, and they voted in a majority of radical Republicans. And the radical Republicans were like a vindictive, a vindictive sort of abolitionist to ensure that the South would be put in its place. So, for instance, as President Andrew Johnson had allowed just one tenth of each state in the South to write a formal apology at a poll and the rest could go and run for election again and vote for office. And they put in the same pre-Civil War leaders, right? The Northern gentlemen began taking role in the House and Senate and they refused to say a single Southerner's name. Southerner said, pardon me, my name wasn't called. I said, oh, no, we don't recognize you anymore. We don't recognize presidential reconstruction under your Southern president. We, Congress, are in charge of it now. And so at any rate, at that point, they sent them home, and they instituted the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment is huge, stating that you, anyone born or naturalized in any single state in this country is entitled to the rights, privileges, and protections of citizenship in any state where he or she moves to, known as comity, that you're safe. The Bill of Rights are extended now across all the states. That wasn't even the case, you guys, before the Civil War. 
So now it is. Article 2 of the 14th Amendment stated that if you had at any time pledged allegiance to the Constitution and then subsequently broke that allegiance by joining or helping the Confederacy during the Civil War in any way, uh, your citizenship rights were taken from you moment, um, temporarily for two years. The fancy word is disenfranchised. And guess who became disenfranchised? Basically all the leaders of the white South because of becoming military officers, becoming lawyers, judges, etc. They had at one time uh, vowed to defend the Constitution. Some states added to that and literally it's called the uh, ironclad oath stated that it didn't matter if you had promised to um, support the constitution or not, that even as a lay person, if you had joined the Confederacy against this country, uh, then you were to be disenfranchised for two years as well. So from 1868 to 1870, the, those years, you guys, is a time of like, is depicted by some as absolutely poetic justice. Because guess what? Going to the polls and voting and voting for were the, the black soil delta of Mississippi and Alabama, the entire state of South Carolina, and much of the New Orleans area of Louisiana voted in a majority of, quote, Negro politicians. And when they first brought them in, they were um, kind of conciliatory, according to um, several popular sources, like Eric Foner. F-O-N-E-R is a big historian on this, where they tried to, to placate the angry white Southerners and saying, hey, we're not going to take your land, right? We're not going to do anything that radical. We're not going to make uh, um, institute, uh, you know, institutions and uh, programs only for black kids and black adults, right? We'll do it for, for you as well, for all Southerners in this state. And they also kind of deferred to one another to, to African-Americans who had um, already had a taste of freedom, already been educated, or already had been pretty successful, uh, whether it be as a soldier, as a business owner in a Black part of town where they were allowed uh, to subsist with Black clientele, or Black preachers. But by the end of that period, from 1868 to 1870, Foner says it got a little bit more and more radical, so that by 1870, they were electing um, freedmen, ex-slaves, who could not even read and write. And of course, not their fault. It was illegal to have them taught such. And they had to have a scribe with them uh, and the legislator with them to read and write things for them. But there was that sense, right, of that, hey, these are the people who know what it's like to suffer. They know what's best for us as the African-American people. And it, it, it had evolved to that point by 1870. But they tackled so many things. The popular interpretation by W.E.B. Du Bois is that they, um, they bit off more than they could chew. They did public school systems. They did modern prison systems. They did modern asylum systems. They tried safety net legislation uh, to give unemployment and help to, to those who were injured and without jobs. And what's a common uh, uh, aid to the elderly who no longer had their, their slave, uh, their masters uh, who were societally expected to take care of them because they'd worked for them for nothing? throughout all their prime years. 
but the common denominator in all those things, right, is money. Is one southern state after another started having financial problems. They were spending themselves into debt. Then the press made things worse. When they caught a handful of African American um, politicians uh, guilty of corruption. Because this time of growth of the second industrial revolution was an incredible time of, of different types of corruption. And I think I'm going to wait on that one when we get to the Gilded Age assignment. But the African Americans were nearly as well represented with that corruption as the white Americans were throughout the rest of the country. But they were thrown under the bus. The KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, under Nathan Bedford Forrest, erupted and began attacking two out of 10. I'm surprised it was even that low. Two out of 10 African Americans go into the polls on election days to vote. They're brutally attacked by the KKK. People were contending something has to be done with the school system because of white flight. White parents were refusing to send their kids to these public schools because the black kids were invited and integrated and to be sit alongside the white kids in these southern states, but the white parents were not having that. And then the North just lost interest, you guys. Because before you know, 1876, 1877 come along. And now the war's been over, you know, since 1865. And they had other things on their mind, filling the newspapers, etc. So supposedly the white Southerners, or the, the, the white Democrat, I'm sorry, the white Republicans refused to stand by the black Republicans as the black Republicans became the scapegoat for everything that was going awry and left them hanging. So hence, they helped, except for when the going got tough. Then the Republicans backed off. Then it was each man for himself. All right. And number four is just very simple. A law can't change the way people feel about someone else. Laws don't change hearts and minds. Putting kids together in integrated schools, integrated churches, that may have that may have have um, fostered some hope, but they didn't stick to those plans, and instead they just looked to mere laws: "Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that," and these external laws. You know, going back to Aristotle, that's not enough. You need something to move the man or woman internally in his or her heart and mind. So it was too superficial. Their attempt to help African-Americans in the South. As you see there in the last sentence, let me see now. I want to do I'll go to Pirates Net.
Shoot. Okay. I just have reconstruction. I have a sample. Okay. I have a sample response that I'm going to post after this video. Okay. For this first one, just give you an idea, a general idea as you're beginning to write, put something together as to what I subjectively am expecting uh, to see from you uh, on these, um, on these write-ups. So remember, you're, you're discerning what the thesis was. You're demonstrating an example or two of how that thesis is being defended by the writer. And then you're telling me why such a thesis is or is not credibly supported. And as long as you show and prove to me why, I don't care if you agree or disagree with it or not. All right. So you have till Sunday night to just simply do that. Uh, like I said, please read the first two and then please analyze and evaluate your choice of either number three or number four on reconstruction. If I could, I know I was the same way as a student. I was very bashful. Um, but can I please get a little bit of feedback from somebody? Let you guys hear me, uh, anything that's not quite clear, et cetera, especially just being the first class. Hi, I have a question. This sure. is Shelby. So on the assignment, are we like giving our opinion on what we on what we read or are we researching it? Okay, good question. The second of the two parts of it um, does entail your opinion, absolutely. So the first part, right, is objective. Okay. There is a right or wrong answer. And that is when you read that section, what was my intended thesis? What was my main argument? that I tried to convey throughout that section, right? And to be honest, especially as I myself put these together, however weekly defended or whatever, however late at night I put it together, um, I have a definitive thesis that I intended to make on each of them, right? So with that one, there kind of is a right or wrong answer, Shelby. Uh, okay. I, I wanna see that you have, that you can capture what my main idea was, what my main intended idea was, okay? And then, like I said, maybe give one or two examples, either with facts or with logical points that I used to support that argument. Then feel free to tear into it. Then it's all your okay. opinion. And okay. tell me why you do or do not buy my message. Okay. Okay? All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Uh-huh. No problem. All right. So anyone else? Okay. So please remember, okay, uh, by the census, uh, because, you know, I don't see you twice a week uh, as an in-person class, as I would in an in-person class, the only way by which I know uh, you're in the class of participating is by submitting answers, right? So please note the, um, I believe it's what, the 22nd? So we got a little bit, but before the census date, um, it's just that simple. I look and say, okay, here are the first two assignments or maybe the first three assignments sometimes. Uh, nothing was turned in for any of those two or three. Bam, I'm dropping this student. And it's not punitive. It, it's covering my own butt. It's the job I am supposed to do or my deans are not happy with me. Okay, it's something to do with the allotment, the financial allotment from the state. So please, okay, um, make sure that you you uh, submit your response uh, to the first one or two assignments uh, so that I know you're in class and I know not to drop you as a no-show. Yes, yeah, Stormy. So I was looking over, um, where is the sample response in the modules? 
No, that's the thing is I could have sworn it was there. Uh, let's see, I'm here on it myself and it's supposed to be right under reconstruction. I like to put it right under the first assignment itself. So yeah, as soon as I get off, I'm going to put it on there. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I came in a little bit late, so I didn't hear about yeah, that. No problem. No problem. I know I came, I was disappointed in myself. I came to look for it. I was going to open it up and talk about it. And I mentioned to the class, probably just before you got on, I said, shoot, I somehow, uh, yeah, I missed that out, but I'm going to rectify that ASAP. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So anybody else? All right. Well, it's nice to meet you guys. Okay. And um, I will have, um, I will start putting everything up um, ahead so that you could, you could work ahead of schedule if need be. Notice also next Monday already, the 16th um, is Martin Luther King Day. According to, that's when we're recognizing it here at the school. And so I'm going to have to give a message um, out uh, contending that um, that we have to do uh, our Zoom at another time, okay? Uh, it's one of two times, two times, uh, the 20th of uh, February uh, for George Washington and the 16th of January next Monday for Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, those two Mondays are regular Zoom time. Um, I have no problem with the, those uh, doing them. I'll be, I'll be home. I'll be working on stuff anyway, but I, uh, I think there's a, a legality to it that I have to let you guys enjoy that day off as a, as a recognized holiday. And those are two great figures, uh, King, especially. Um, so at any rate, um, so let me, let me have a little bit of uh, time in a day or two. And I will um, communicate with everyone via an announcement, a class announcement, as to what what time next week we will do our um, our meeting, uh, our Canvas uh, uh, Zoom, instead of Monday the sixteenth. All right. So you guys have a great first week. Okay. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you. Have a good week. You as well. Thank you. Bye-bye.